So let's talk about um, how we decided to use Ansible in the CentOS infrastructure. Um, and first mandatory slide is, some people ask me what was my official title. In the past it was Floor Sweeper in CentOS.org and I was promoted two years ago to Hybrid Clown, uh, still at the same position. Uh, you have to be hybrid these days, it's really a marketing slide. So. Here we go. So we'll, dis we'll discuss a little bit about the history, so from where we are coming from, in from the CentOS uh, infrastructure point of view for configuration management. So how we started to adopt uh, Ansible in the infra. Uh, modularity, but don't leave the room, I will not uh, talk about RPM modules at all. It's about Ansible modularity. And uh, eventually discuss about some plugins that we found useful in the CentOS infrastructure. So a long time ago, so uh, Sean mentioned 20 years of CentOS existence. Um, I only joined the CentOS project in 2006, 2007. 2007 when I organized the CentOS presence at FOSDEM. This was my first contribution. Back then, if you remember CentOS, it was really small. It started as a kind of a side project, fun project. And so it was just running on donated machine. Here, one machine here, one machine there. Back then, a lot of people were just using manual configuration management, meaning SSH or Telnet. Back then, some people were using Telnet to a machine, editing files, and hope for the best. Some people were more clever and using shell scripts and SSH loop. Or some other were using, and raise the hand if you play with that tool back then, cluster SSH. Two person, I'm feeling old now. Thank you, Toshan. <laughs> Um, but in 2007, in the CentOS dev room here at FOSDEM, we had Luke Kennis from Puppet Labs trying to explain to us that, my God, configuration management system is really nice things you should deploy and use. So we started to embrace uh, Puppet back then, starting from release zero dot something, so clearly early adopters. And we were using, again, I'm feeling old, Subversion to store our manifest and our code. And then um, I, we migrate to multiple time, multiple version of puppets, um, except that we decided to use Git because yeah, we were modern back then, around 2014, and instead of having everything into puppets, we wanted to separate the code, the manifest and the modules from the variables. So there will be a talk I think about Foreman tomorrow, which is more about provisioning. But Foreman can be used also as an external node classifier, so a kind of dashboard where you see the pub execution, the modules, and also uh, group your host together and apply some variables. So the puppet is agnostic, it's just code running and fetch all the variables from central place, which was Foreman. Everything was running more or less fine, except that I didn't like puppets. Uh, I prefer Ansible myself. So when we had, uh, and Brian is in the room somewhere, or should be, I think he was there, um, we started to, you, to have an interesting project. When we joined forces with Red Hat, suddenly we had much more resource available for us and for the special interest group. And so we had to deploy a new infra from scratch called CI.center.org where we were just redeploying in loop machine all the time. So we didn't want to use Puppet for that because of a public infrastructure, Puppet agent need a certificate, etc. So just a fire and forget infrastructure that is reinstalled in loop. So Ansible was really perfect for that because it doesn't need its agentless configuration and orchestration tool. And the more we were using it, the more we found it more interesting just to convert some existing task and orchestration task from Puppet to Ansible. And we had internally in the project a discussion and yeah, I won. <laughs> to convert everything from Puppet to Ansible. But we started so small. So once we decided to just migrate completely and fully to Ansible for orchestration and configuration management, we decided to do differently. Things like, oh, now we should step back and think a, bit, a little bit about how we will do it again if we had the chance. And we had the chance to read it from scratch. In the past, it was everything published in one Git repository. We decided now that we should uh, use the approach from Ansible Galaxy without using Ansible Galaxy. So each hole in the CentOS infrastructure is a Git repository. The code is fully open, so you can have a look, you can contribute if you want, you can reuse. I know that some people in the room for another project decided to reuse some of the holes, so it's really great. 
And uh, we also wanted to um, keep uh, re reusability in mind, so reuse what we have, not reinvent the wheel all the time, which is a foundation for configuration management system. The other thing that uh, paid uh, on medium and longer term was a uh, different environment, because that was so easy, and I will have, uh, point to an example, to reinstall from scratch a new environment using the same code but different uh, set of variables. So let's talk about inventories, which is like really how you separate your code, which is coming from the raw, from the execution and it's all the variable, the manifest, everything, the, the group variables. So um, uh, we started with CI, which has its own set of inventories, and then we had another one for public consumption and one for staging to test. That was the, fir the three first one we had. Why do we want to use different environment and uh, different inventories? Because some, set of, some different people can get access to some environment, not, but not on the others. So they can see and change things in staging of CI, but not in production, for example. So it's just a matter of giving them access and that's it. And it paid off really, because suddenly when there was a new thing called CentOS Stream, which I think that everybody is aware now. So when we had to, 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 build, to, to build from scratch, like from scratch a new environment, it was done in several days, because it was a matter of reusing all the code we had and just adapt in a different environment with different set of security policy and so on, but it was easy to deploy. So all our Git repositories, um, unfortunately, or fortunately from an infosec point of view, private, because the code is public, but uh, the, the group variables and et cetera and credentials are obviously secret. And they are also private but encrypted. For this we use, depending on the use case and the uh, environment, we use either Gitcrypt, which is not uh, coming from Ansible at all. Uh, we used that already in the past for Puppet. So it's just, if you don't know it, it's like really easy Git filter that uh, GPG encrypt your commit on the fly for you through asymmetric key, or symmetric key, sorry, or your GPG public key from your developer. So it's really easy to use. Or Ansible Vault uh, for uh, another environment where we just divide our host into what is, can be public and what is really a private like credential for connecting, connecting to a database, for example. So that's for the inventories. For the playbook, nothing secret. They are all available publicly. Uh, they, they are there for, for years. And uh, all the playbook that we use for everything in, in the World Center's infra are hosted there. So just following a naming convention, like role dash something is obviously targeting role. And these are the kind of playbook that runs in loop multiple times a day on the, on the server fleet, just to ensure that machine uh, is running in the declared state and, and it's compliant. And we have other kind of role of a playbook for deploying things on the fly or ad hoc task uh, orchestrated, orchestrated by, let's say, a trigger coming from Zabbix monitoring or from another API uh, services like uh, if you know the CI environment, we deploy machine on the fly for you. Uh, it's called, it's done by Ansible behind the scenes. Everything is there publicly. And um, it's coming from one of these ad hoc tasks to deploy a C2 instance on the fly or something else. About the role, um, something we decided from day one uh, when discussing with Brian, we agreed to use the role, but we were also having in mind a way to test these roles somewhere. So each of the role has at least two branches. I know that some people would say that master and main should be development branch or whatever, like it can be a discussion. In our case, we decided that the main branch was the production one, and we have a staging branch where we just accept uh, pull requests because it's on GitHub, uh, and where we test this. And that means that the branch corresponds to the environment in which it would be uh, played for the playbook and the role. So that when we are confident enough that it works fine in staging, well, we can just merge back into main and it will be deployed to production again. Uh, all the roles are more or less self-contained, so they have default variable for everything, which are not reflecting the reality, but at least if you want to play around with the role, you can just give it a try. Of course, we just want to ensure that uh, we have a kind of pyramid of uh, role 
uh, where, for example, let's let's say, let's have a look at Pagur, for example. Pagur needs um, Apache server, it needs a database, and so on. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel in all the roles. We just want to include on the f on the fly all the other roles, so that if we modify one role for a security perspective or, or change in the cipher for multi LS, it's it's done for all the machine in, uh, across the server fleet, and it doesn't need to be changed in all the roles. Um, so we just include. Um, if you're familiar with Ansible, you can, in a role, the meta, uh, use a meta slash main or YAML file to declare that your role has a dependency, but it's just like plain dependency, so it will just play the role no matter what. If you include or import a role on the fly in your role, you can, for visibility purposes, you can see it, but you can also pass some specific variable the way you want to import your role. So it will be really interesting because if you are a developer or a sysadmin, you look at your code and you see what it's doing and how, and, and it will be inherited everywhere. So let's talk about a little bit about the branch. Um, if you play with Ansible Galaxy, you know that you can have all your role for your Ansible environment. You can declare all that into a requirement.yaml file. It's all about YAML these days, right? So configuration management means YAML farmer, in fact. Um, you, can you can specify all your roles, so, so it's a snippet here, where you can find your role, the upstream role, a Git repository, then the local name for the role, and the version. The version can be a git tag or a branch, which is what we wanted to use, perfectly fine. So in that example, this is the one, the requirement YAML for staging, obvious. But then uh, we hit it some interesting problem. If you use Ansible Galaxy, you can, you see from the command line, uh, you can install your role locally, that's good. But what about things that change in the upstream branch, the, 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 in the staging branch upstream? Ansible Galaxy, do you think that just playing install will just keep it up to date? Well, sorry for you, but it doesn't. So I was a little bit surprised that Ansible Galaxy let you install it, but not update a role locally, uh, which is a problem if you suddenly have a machine that is supposed to keep your server fleet up to date. That's where I found another tool uh, written by uh, another of my Red Hat colleagues called Ansible role CTL, which is basically a Python wrapper around, around Ansible and Git, so it, it understands how to parse the requirement YAML file, and then also verify your state, the status of your role, check it out locally, if you are up to date or not, and update your role, so what is in fact missing in Ansible Galaxy itself. That was my first hunt against Ansible, which I have a love and hate relationship with Ansible these days, in fact. <laughs> Here's the second part, collection. If you started to play with Ansible like in 2011, everything was fine and the mantra was, if you remember, battery included. Everything was into one package, Ansible, everything. But it grew so much over the years that it was becoming a problem for both the people um, contributing to some modules and, and to Ansible, and then the Ansible core engine people having to suddenly have to orchestrate the release of Ansible. So you know that they decided to split into Ansible core, which is really small, and then you have the, a, a huge amount of collection maintained by community or by other folks. So there is one package, it was an attempt to have one package uh, that I think the, the spec file exists still in Fedora to just have Ansible would, would download Ansible core and the collection. But I think you end up with something like 500 megabyte package that doesn't even have, uh, have all the dependency resolved from a Python point of view, because this is the other problem. Ansible core targets a specific Python interpreter, which changed plenty of time into RHEL 8 and RHEL 9, meaning that suddenly the package, like the, P, the package in Apple, don't follow. It's impossible to maintain these. So you are basically back to control that through pip. This is what we had to do for CentOS Infra, and we have a role to, well, to maintain Ansible itself. So we have Ansible-role-Ansible-host that keeps that up to date. How do we uh, manage the collection? We just, and this is more or less my, my advice to you as sysadmin, you know 
example, you're doing for better than anyone else. So you should be cherry picking what you need, the version that you know that you have tested, and just keep it as minimal as possible because you will have to maintain it. So that's the approach we decided to use. Use Ansible Core and just a subset of collection de declare in, guess what? Requirement.yaml file again. And um, you can also point to a specific version, git commit, uh, a git tag of, uh, of a collection. This is, for example, a snippet of what we are using at the moment in the infra, but everything is public, so feel free to have a look. And how do we uh, maintain this and keep that up to date? Ansible role CTL again, that manage both the roles and the collection. We also um, thought about from day one, outside of the role, we probably have to distribute some specific file in the environment. Think about, well, end-to-end -end encryption. Of course, we don't want to store our private key into a Git repository that is public or like in a role. So from day one, we just have two different environments, two different directories, which are considered by Ansible Core in our case, which is called PKI store, just to store PKI files, so whether it's a key tab or just like a, a private key for certificate, TLS, and so on and so on. And we distribute these from central location. So Ansible is responsible to just redeploy keys on the fly in private key, renew certificate, and so on. Or other file that, for obvious reason, can't be made public. Um, it happens in some kind of environment where we just have to keep things. You can, from the role, you can guess that it's doing something, but the file, you don't have access to the file for obvious reason. So all combined together, uh, our, role, uh, our environment looks like this at the end. So we have just Ansible CFG, which is explaining how you should run Ansible, all the plugin that we use and so on. The collection, inventory, everything is automated by Ansible itself on itself, just to keep uh, the environment up to date. And then about some plugin that we use. Um, uh, I don't know if people in the room know Mitogen. I knew that Toshan would say yes, of course. So if you have to play with uh, a, a widespread environment like we do, remember in CentOS we have machine running in the US, in Europe, in Malaysia, in Japan, in Australia. And we control that from one single instance of Ansible, where we have multiple for different reasons, but we wanted to speed execution up because the main complaint about Ansible was that it was slow. Um, one plugin that speed things really up is Mitogen, which is uh, really much better than pipelining in Ansible. This is uh, one example you can use. And if you have a look at the way we manage it, it's like, I like Mitogen because it's, it's non-invasive. So it's just a, a strategy that you just have to enable or disable in your Ansible ex environment execution, uh, execution environment. So it's easy to, to keep, to disable or enable on the fly, but it's really helping a lot. Talking about uh, speeding up Ansible, I hope that you are profiling your Ansible Playbook core, if you are using Ansible. Uh, and you probably noticed that the most annoying thing with Ansible, talking about the, the, um, the time that you need is file gathering. Each time that you want to, by default, you want to just play a role or whatever, it's just like, oh, I need to contact the host and the group of hosts and collect all the facts. And sometimes this is the most time consuming process for just to play something small in the role. So just to speed that up, um, we also, well, these are the, the, the profile, so if you want to have a look at profiling your uh, task, task by task in your play, you can enable that. And um, Ansible can keep that in cache. So it can keep that in local cache, in memory, in memcache, I think, or just like JSON file on the file system. And if you change that to smart, uh, it will just wait for a timeout to be reached to just contact the host again to just say, oh, which version are you, uh, of Ansible are you, well, what is the operating system, what is the memory, what are the number of cores, and so on. All the variables that you would use in your uh, templates. So it speeds things uh, up a, a lot. Talking about um, reporting, I mentioned, if you remember, in the, at the beginning that we were coming from Puppet with Foreman. And Foreman had something really interesting called Puppet Dashboard built in. So from a system point of view, you could have a look at a nice dashboard about uh, all the puppet runs uh, when the agent is doing the check-in. 
there, there is also such thing that you can do outside of AWX, which I know exists, because people will point me to AWX. But outside of that, there is something which is really small to set up called ARA, so Ansible records Ansible. Uh, I think that two years ago during COVID, I did a co, we, we did a co-presentation co with the maintainer just to explain how we were using it. So if you never play with it, it's really nice because it's really simple to set up. And this is an example of the, the it's, a, it's an old screenshot by the way, which I just reused because I'm just lazy. Uh, same thing, uh, keep it stupid and simple. So what I like with, with ARA, it's again, it's a simple thing that you need to enable in your Ansible.cfg file or not, it's up to you. It's non-invasive, there is no change in Ansible co uh, code at all, it's just a, a callback plugin that you just need to, to enable. And I think that I'm just on time because I got a time reminder for, finally, I have time for Q&A. So, do you have a question? Uh, let's start with uh, Christian. Uh, it's, it's really just a question uh, on, on Ansible. Do you have any uh, experience yet with uh, running Podman quadlets with Ansible? Uh, I know there's a, if, if for, for those uh, who haven't heard of Podman quadlets, uh, it's a, a declarative way of describing containers very similar to the system D uh, units. Um, and actually it's a system D unit generator that takes those as an input and then generates system D units out of that. Um, making for a very nice way, uh, I think, um, of managing containers on a local machine. Um, yeah, have, have you uh, in investigated any, any Quadlet Podman work yet? Um, Podman, yes, Quadlet, not yet. So I'm aware of Quadlet and I find it interesting, but it's it's a little bit of locally competing, like it's more or less the kind of Docker Compose equivalent, right, right. from the Podman world. Um, but it's really interesting. At the, on the other side, it's competing against OpenShift if you have OpenShift, because you would just, so it's more or less the same thing, but on a single host. But we have, if you go to uh, the place I mentioned, you will see that we have an Ansible-Roll-Podman host because we were also deploying some containers and orchestrating containers to generate systemd and start the container with an Ansible role. I never investigated Quadlet, but it's on my it's on my radar and my already too long to-do list. So, but I'm aware of it, yes. So I will, but if you have a suggestion. I, I have an example. I've, I've written it in Nextcloud Quadlet to deploy that in a couple of, in, in a pod with Podman 5, it'll, th there'll be a, a pod quadlet where you essentially have a file for the pod. Um, and yeah, I was looking for ways to, to making de deployment of that a little easier. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to collaborate on that, definitely. That, that, so we, are, we have plenty of witnesses in the room that you just uh, volunteer yourself to do it and so just- I, uh, Well, I, 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 I have that so. deployed on my machine at home, so I'll need to maintain it anyways. Um, so yeah. Okay, good. But that's, that's a good thing. I, I, I was aware, so I'll, I'll, yeah, it's on my to-do list to have a look. Even if we don't have a need now, it's something I would like to support in our existing Podman role. So well, thank you. Let's thank you for your that. contribution. <laughs> so next year, the topic will be deploying Podman Quadet with Ansible, given by Christian and myself. Here we go, written. Next one, Davide. Um, from the way you are describing, I think you use Ansible in uh, the push mode. So you have like a orchestrator somewhere where you push configs to the machines? Yeah, uh, yes, um, in say, say it's push mode and not pull mode because yes. pull mode, will, yeah, I, I had a look at pull mode and it's, it's the pull mode is more or less the old puppet as, as style of the agent is connecting to a puppet master D and checking in and uh, do you have something that you would like me to apply? It, but it, even if on technical level it, it scale out easily, you need to read trust from where you are pulling and so give credential on all the hosts to then reach your, let's say, private Git repository or whatever, which is then, I think, can be a security issue if you have to trust machine that by default you don't trust, like a donated machine. So we just prefer to, to use the, the push approach. This is a good question I, I should have mentioned in the slide, but the way we trigger is that we have a regular cron job like con contacting the fleets automatically and reporting into our, into our uh, ARA. But we, ha we have also like semi-manual thing where we just have ad hoc task or like we know that we want to, pu to push a change now. 
the way we built inventory, so uh, I work with, for example, the stream team, Cento stream team, uh, Troy can, can witness that. Um, they have now from GitLab perspective a pipeline automatically being applying changes through Ansible without asking me to do it. And they have the report automatically into the GitLab merge request. So we have multiple way of kicking Ansible, like GitLab pipelines, semi-automation, Zabbix notification for some specific task, and regular uh, cron job just to uh, ensure that the, the server fleet is safe. No more questions? If you still have questions, I'm, I'm still available for at least until Sunday night, so that's fine. No question online, uh, Sean? No questions online, no. That means that I'm done, thank you. <laughs>